home, you better be there next week. Abundant Life 6 to 8. But I'm here now to tell you all now. I spoke to you all to tell you all. I don't want you all to make me shame with these tickets. I have 50 more to go. More, uh, more importantly, they ask that people would also sign up for, like I tell you, the South or Johnny Cake or whatever, and they were hoping that if each church could try to provide enough for the 100 tickets that we have. So please see me, Leticia, anybody that, uh, Melody, Rochelle, any one of us um, after church because nobody's signing up. Don't shame me. 50 more tickets to go. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. We invite you again to ensure as you, your programs, you have your programs, to just go through your programs in the evenings, uh, certainly when you leave church, to see uh, the wonderful opportunities to pray for members of the church who are uh, dealing with different issues, uh, special prayers, and so just want you to be minded of that. We do want to take a special moment to recognize those persons who are celebrating their birthdays during the course of this week and want to wish them a special happy birthday. Uh, we do have celebrating on the 28th, Andrick Delavo. Uh, brother and Elder Greg Williams and Nicholas Ramming are celebrating theirs on the 26th. Celebrating on the 25th, Dr. Suzette Lynn, uh, Jason Musgrove, and Angelique Darbo. And on the 24th, we have Natasha Jones, Desiree Knowles, Jada Edmondson is celebrating the birthday on the 23rd. And today, we have celebrating their birthday, Candy Jones, Tatiana Moxie, and Kirkwood Mott Jr. You know this person's here this morning? So you know if you're here, we, they're here. If, if one of those names are here, you need to stand so we can see you. Because if you're here, we got to sing. Candy is here. I see Candy. I think I saw Kirkwood as well. Excellent, excellent. So let's bring it up. Let's wish them a, a wonderful happy birthday. Let's sing to them, Grace, and wish them a wonderful birthday. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday, 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 we love you, 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 happy birthday. At this time, we're going to dismiss, dismiss our young persons for Sunday school. So our young people, our teachers, please come at this time, and you are officially dismissed. Again, that's the case to the grade six. You're dismissed for Sunday school. It's a sunny inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my love. It's a sunny inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my love. It's a sunny inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. We're going to lift the offering. I'm going to invite everyone to please stand as we together recite the offertory covenant and our ushers come at this time. Shall we together honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your substance? Then your bonds will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Those words come from Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, and from Luke 6 and 38. Shall we 
Father, we thank you again for your many blessings to us, your children. Father, we realize that you are our provider. We know, Father, that in your might and your strength, you give us everything we need. Father, we just ask you now to just bless this time, bless this offering that we're about to give you, O God. We pray that we continue to give it in a hilarious and cheerful manner, knowing that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Father, we take this opportunity once again to thank you and to proclaim you as Lord and Savior of our lives. Get blessing and honor, glory and power, now and forevermore. Amen. We're pleased one more time to have favor us with a musical selection, the Royal Bahamas Police Force Band.
you enjoyed it, give them a round of applause one more time, please. At this time, it is certainly a pleasure of mine to invite Superintendent Campbell to come at this time to bring greetings on behalf of the Royal Bahamas Police Force Band. Please welcome him. Good morning, Grace. Good morning. To your senior pastor, Pastor Bethel, associate, Pastor Hannah, my good friend. Indeed, it's a pleasure to be right where we are this morning in Grace. Three years ago, on assuming leadership of the this world renowned World Bombs Release Force Band, we had intended to um, attend church every year as we began our new agenda for the year. It was supposed to be within the ranks and file of my leadership. But last year after our church service last year at Transfiguration, um, Sergeant Twinkress retired, asked if we can grace him at grace. <laughs> And here we are this morning, gracing you. We were supposed to be at the Methodist Church with Inspector Hunter, but I could not say no to someone who would have served so well for so many years. <laughs> so on behalf of our the missioner, who have other duties this morning, then you could not be here with us, Commissioner Ellison Greenslade and his top team. We say thank you to you for hosting us. And Pastor, we will come again. I don't know if it will be as soon as next week. <laughs> but because of your warm welcome, we will come again. And God bless you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is now a pleasure of mine to invite to the pulpit the senior pastor of Grace Community Church with the word from God. Please welcome Senior Pastor Lyle Bethel. And as he comes, I'm going to invite you to stand. We have his favorite song that we are going to sing, but certainly a song that will minister to all of us. Master Speak.
You may be seated. Just before Pastor Lyle comes, we want to invite our brother Llewellyn Armstrong to come at this time uh, just to introduce our mission moments, a video presentation, and immediately after you will hear from the senior pastor, Lyle Bethel. Good morning, Grace, Grace members. As you know, our annual missions conference is upcoming, and it's exactly one week away, and it is the first time that we're going to be having a missions conference without our leader, Brother Rudolph Cartwright, who has passed and gone on to be with the Lord. And we are, our guest speaker for the conference is Pastor Lee from Calvary Bible Church, and he insisted that he wants to do it this year as well in light of the fact that Brother Rudy has passed on and sort of a tribute to Brother Rudy in spite of his, um, his challenges, his health challenges. And I just want to remind you that it begins on Sunday, the 29th of February. Um, it continues on Wednesday, sorry, 29th of January. It continues on Wednesday the 1st with, our prayer, fo with prayer focus for our missionaries. <clears throat> it's very important because you will see where your missions support goes and what it, what it helps, how it helps to spread the gospel, how it helps missionaries in the field that to go places where you and I will probably never, ever go. And it will conclude on Sunday, the 5th of February, with a closing with Pastor Lee again. Um, you're about to see a video, a three-minute clip on, on missions. And as you know, especially in recent times, you know, we have this idea as Christians that there's a demon under every rock. There's a hundred demons over our nation. Um, someone said to me one time, there's a spirit of murder over this nation, and a demon of murder. And I said to them, you know, You'll be amazed to see how quickly that demon leaves if we start enforcing laws and executing people. So enjoy these missions moments for me. The next three minutes. We blame the devil for all kind of things. The devil is bad. Okay, I understand that. But the poor devil get blamed for everything under the sun. Yes. Devil is bad, I admit. But I'm telling you something. Your enemy, my enemy, more than you realize is not the devil. It is our own self-centeredness. And Jesus came not only to save me from my sin and hell, but during my life in this pilgrimage to set me free from my own self-centeredness. The church is so totally disobedient in picking up the cross and willing to lay down their life like Amy Carmichael Jetson. And thousands who marched the way of the cross and were martyred instead of committing our life for sacrifice and death. We blame the devil for the whole world going to hell. My brother, my sister, I am not here to put you on a guilt trip, intimidate you, get something out of you and run to the next place. That's not my purpose here. But I want to ask you one simple question. When you heard over 100,000 people died in Rwanda in a few days' time, when you heard in a week over 100,000 swept away from Bangladesh into the oceans and millions left homeless, where were you? What happened to you the following day? 
Did your son ask you, Mama, why are you not eating today? After three days, your son said, Daddy, it seems that you are not eating any food. What happened? Are you sick? And he said, My son, you remember we watched the news and saw what happened? Yes, Daddy. Son, I'm so broken hearted over the millions that are perishing that I decided to fast and pray and stand in the gap on the behalf of a world that is going to hell and forever without Jesus. That's the only reason. When was the last time you as a family sat down and said, let's talk about it. Half of the world going to bed with empty stomach and naked bodies. Some 80,000 die every day and slip into hell. You and your wife and kids and as a family, when was the last Last time you made a pact, a discussion and say, we will live as strangers and pilgrims on this earth with sacrifice and commitment and tears and fasting and touch the lost world with our lifestyle and commitment. Amen. Amen. We, we are looking forward next week to begin our missions conference. Our theme, again, the unfinished task. There is work to be done, and as the video with Brother Johan, I forget his first name, has ably reminded us, we can blame the devil, or we can say, you know what, I have the authority, the responsibility as a child of God to take this issue to prayer, to use the resources God has given me, to uh, send monies to missionaries, to pray for those who are persecuted. And we can, rather than sitting there as spectators, we can get on our knees as those who are impacting the world through our prayers, through our, our missions, through our giving, and uh, through our going. And so we again are encouraging you to ask God to speak to you in the coming week to prepare you for our missions conference, that God would get a response out of you rather than an excuse. Amen. Well, knowing that our time together would be one where we will be highlighting the Word of God in our our um, Lamplighters program, and knowing that the police force was going to be with us uh, uh, today, the Royal Baham Bahamas Police Force, wanted to find a word that would touch all of us. And so I've chosen a word because I believe at the beginning of the year we, we want our new commitments made. We want to do better than we did last year, but many of us are tired. We're tired. And so I have uh, found, I believe, a word that addresses all of us that will... Uh, have something to say to all of us, and uh, we can look forward to that. You need to turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings 17. We'll be looking at that. In fact, we'll be touching on a number of chapters of the book of Kings. But before that, uh, some good news. Sister Ramona has returned. We're told that her surgeries were successful. I uh, remember we lifted her up in prayer. Ramona's in our audience. Ramona, uh, just wave to be acknowledged. Uh, we're grateful to God for his work with her. Uh, uh, medical team that helped her in that regard. And um, uh, Superintendent uh, Campbell, we have been delighted to have you with us. This has been a, a treasure. Um, the MC, uh, your reserve officer, Charles Seeley, I want to underscore what he said. Please, please feel free to return anytime. Anytime. That is phenomenal music. And, and, and church, I want you to know, Yes, there's much to complain about in the world, but I want you to find for me a police force anywhere in the world that sings gospel songs and can come to church and makes a decision that they are going to celebrate the year by coming to church. That's phenomenal. I mean, they're singing the songs of Zion. Thanks be to God. Listen, we have to preserve what we have in this country, and uh, we need to make sure that the police force, uh, 
uh, the police force ban and the, the, the entire defense force of our country receive our ongoing prayers and support. They are recruiting young persons using music um, to, to get them involved in protecting our land, protecting our nation. We are deeply grateful for that. To our beloved member, uh, Brother Dougie Turnquest, better known as Ginger and many other nicknames, we're so grateful for your service of dedication. You, you've served in so many ways. You've blessed this country by your musical talent. And you've also passed it on in your, your son, whom we were treated to once again earlier this morning. So much to be grateful for. And I'm glad to be a part of a country where the police force and the defense force are singing the songs of Zion and pointing souls to Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we continue with a word of prayer? And uh, we can lick up one verse of Master Speak. Uh, I, you know I don't like to have no interruption between me and Master Speak. Because you're going to see how germane that song is to our message today. When the Master speaks to you. Oh, what a word, what a word. And so, just a word of prayer, and then we move into our song, and I will return with the word for today. Father, we are so grateful that we have a God that speaks to us. Speaks to us audibly, through his word, through the wise counsel of others. And because you speak to us, our lives have meaning and purpose. Our lives can take on great power. And so we are submitted to you. We want to hear a word from you today. And so we cry, Master, speak. Your servants are listening. Master, speak. Give us direction and purpose. Master, speak. We need a word from you that will take us into this year. Give us faith for what is to come. Give us confidence and trust. And so we surrender ourselves to hear from you. Pray that you'd speak to us. And we would come out of here revived, refreshed, with a new sense of direction and purpose. Not just for today, but in, for the coming year. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. That is your posture today. Master, speak. Your servant is listening. What have you to say to me? We sing. It says, speak to me by name, O oh Master. Woo! Friends, how grateful I am for those times in my life where God has spoken to me by name and given me a new fo focus, a new sense of refreshment, a new sense of direction. My life has been changed. I'm here today because I have learned to be a servant to the master as he speaks and to shift when he says move and to move when his power is present in my life to do as he says. I want to speak to you about a man today named Elijah. Now, I don't know about you, but nobody, and I mean nobody, thrills me in the Bible like Elijah. Yes, even beyond Jesus. You see, when I first began to read about Elijah. I said, whoa, what a man. And he inspired me uh, as, I, as I gave this message in another place. Somebody said, you know, I, I could see you like Elijah. I could see it. And, and because so much of my life, I, 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 have, I have seen that a man yielded to God, trusting God, could believe God for some big things and sense some big shifts in his life. And so I've always loved Elijah. Now, I, I love me and my Jesus more. Don't get me wrong. But Eli you know, Jesus is Jesus. Elijah is a man like me. Anyone out there hearing me? Yes. You see, Jesus became a man for us that, that, that we could know how to respond to God. But, you know, Jesus was sinless. Elijah was a man like me. And, in fact, because Elijah was a man like me and because Elijah has some experiences that framed who he was and... 
you have those similar experiences. I want to lift up Elijah because in the book of James, it says this. Elijah was a man just like you. You see, there's a tendency to focus on the power of Elijah, the prayers of Elijah, the wonders of who Elijah was. But today we're going to read a passage of scripture that we see another side of Elijah. And I believe this passage of scripture is going to help us as we go into this new year to understand when we're overwhelmed and burdened and we want to give up, we need to hear that word from our master. And it has a way of refreshing, reviving us, and bringing us back. And so we want to talk about Elijah. No time to get into everything today, but the basic context, as you know, Israel has this wonderful position with, with God. They're this favored nation. They're living forth his will and his word, at least that's what they're supposed to do. But there was always this cycle of sin. A good king, certainly in the nation of Judah, a good king raises up. They're doing well. An evil king comes. They do badly and so forth. But the sister nation, Israel, has never had a godly king. And then comes along a wretched, wretched, wretched king by the name of King Ahab. And as wretched as he was, he grabbed himself a babbit of a queen. And it is said, it is said, his, his epithet in the scriptures, he did more evil to provoke the Lord than any other king before him. And he had this woman, Jezebel, teaching him the levels of wickedness and, and scorn with which they could keep against the God of Israel. And in the midst of this, God brings forth his prophet Elijah. I would like to preach to you today about Elijah on, the, on Mount Carmel against the, the, the prophets of Baal and the Ashtoreth uh, when he squared off against 850 prophets, but that's not my message today. I love me up on Elijah, I tell you. But that's not my message today. In fact, my message starts immediately after that incident. Because I want to help you in your faith. Because I suspect many are here today tired, fed up, burned out, ready to throw in the towel. Not sure how you're going to be able to get through this year, despite all that we've been able to say in the messages thus far. And so, we come to 1 Kings 119, and we read as follows. Now, as I said, they just had this powerful, powerful confrontation on Mount Carmel. Elijah has called together the prophets of Baal and the, Ash and the prophets of the Ashtoreth. And he has said to the people, how long will you halt between two opinions? If God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. But stop this indecisiveness. Stop this halting between two opinions. You ain't sure which God you will serve. And he calls this great contest. He says, may the God who is truly God answer by fire. And he sets up the sacrifice. The prophets of Baal and the Asherah can set up their sacrifice. And he'll set up his. And the God that answers by the prayer of his prophets and answers by fire, let all Israel know that that is a real God. You know the prophets of Baal and the Asherah, they went on and on and on all day cutting themselves down. They go, oh, Baal, hear us! Oh, Baal, hear us! Whole day going on, um, Elijah starts to mock them. Where's your God? Maybe he's in the bathroom. May call a little louder. Maybe he can't hear you. And when it became clear to the assembled crowd of the Israelites, the mil millions of them gathered, he says, all right, enough of this. God time now. And he sets up a sacrifice, 12 stones, representing the 12 twi tribes of Israel from uncut stones, and he sets it up. He puts the, he, he, the sacrifice, he butchers the, 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 the animal, puts it there, and he does an amazing thing. He pours water on the sacrifice. Digs a trench around that altar and pours more and more water. Now, folks, if you want to have a barbecue, the first thing you do is not to pour water on the, on the barbecue. Yeah, that's not just the way to do it. Elijah gets up, begins to speak, O oh Lord, show that you are the God of Israel. And he finished talking. Fire falls. Boom. Altar is obliterated. Water gone. Everybody can see the Lord, he is God. And they fall on their faces. Baal worship is, at this point, finished. Prophets of Baal and the Asherah killed in plain sight. Elijah ain't finished yet. he got to pray for rain. Remember, by his prayer, it's not rain for three and a half years. So Elijah goes and prays. Seven times he prays. And then he sees 
a cloud like a fish. There's been no cloud in the sky. But now he sees a cloud coming over the water, the size of a fish, coming. He goes to the king and says, listen, rain coming. It, get to where you need to go because rain is coming. I hear the sound of rain. King gets his chariot, take off. Elijah does a forest gum, pull up his pants, pull off, beat him, beat him back to the capital. Elijah is the main man. Everybody talking about Elijah. The man of God has arrived. What a great man. Problem is, the king also talking about Elijah, and he goes to tell his wife what happened. And there we take up our story. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. You can imagine Jezebel say, what? What? Because you know she had some of her favorite prophets. They did. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow you are alive. Translation, you are dead man, Negro. <laughs> you are a living dead man. Tomorrow you are dead. The great prophet Elijah, with this great victory before him, what does Elijah do? Thunder of proclamation back? No. No, friends. Elijah was afraid, verse 3, and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. What? Elijah? The same Elijah that we saw so victorious the day before? That Elijah? Yes. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. I am no better than my fathers. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up. Get up and eat, Elijah. And he looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of God came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? You see, God commissioned him to be prophet over Israel. What are you doing all the way down here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord. Some of you know about that. You've been zealous for the Lord. It ain't fair what's happening to you now. Not someone who's been as zealous as you. I have been zealous for the Lord. The God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me as well. And the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. The Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. Ah, but the Lord was not in the wind. Let me help you something, because you don't know this. This Mount Horeb, this is the same mountain that Moses was on. This Mount Horeb, remember, God came down on the mountain. The mountain was ablaze with fire. 
God came down on the mountain and the whole place shook. God came on the mountain, there's wind and storm and everything. This is the same mountain. Elijah is a God, is a man who's seen God in power. That's all he knows, a God of power. That's all he knows about God. And he's on the same, that's why maybe he went to Mount Horeb. I want to see this God of power. Where is he? How did he let this happen to me? So he goes to the place of power. Mount Horeb. But ah, on Mount Horeb, the same mighty wind is moving. But God ain't the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. What's going on? And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword and I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. You sang master speak, thy servant hear it? Well, here's the master speaking. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Melor, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazel. And Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet, listen to me, Elijah, you who think you are the only one. Yet, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Just for your information. Careful questioning my sovereignty and what I'm doing, Elijah. So Elijah went out from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah, saying, Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said. He knows what's going on. He's just been anointed, the successor. And he said, And then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. In other words, he's saying goodbye to his trade. He's accepted this, and he's going with Elisha. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Powerful bit of scripture. I want to address this and give us some things to work with. The things will help us as we find ourselves in the place we're at. We see at least four sources of despair in Elijah's life that are often found in our lives today. And you have them there in your handouts. We're going to fill in the blanks for you. The first is this. Elijah was depleted by victory. He was depleted by victory. Listen, how many times have we been a part of a, 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 um, a, a crusade that's going on or some big event? Um, there's all that pre-work before it, preparations, meetings, this, that, and the other, and then the meeting takes place. Certainly the Royal Bahamas Defense Force Band, as you move about and go from place to place, there's all of this adrenaline flowing. You're just, you're just excited. And you're, you're literally riding on adrenaline. You're riding on adrenaline. You're on this high for days on end. And certainly Elijah was. Elijah had been on a high. No one has done what Elijah has done. I mean, this fellow, three, he prays it don't rain, but three and a half years it don't rain. Uh, uh, he tells a widow, uh, prepare food for me and listen, that your food will never go, uh, will never run out uh, while I'm here. God has promised us. Um, prays fire falls before he finishes prayer. 
prays that rain will come and ain't rain for three and a half years and boom, there comes rain. I mean, what? And on and on and on it goes. He's lived a life of victory. He's seen God in all his power. But you know, after we've been on these moments of victory, there can be just a, the, the adrenaline drops and you come back down reality. And while he is in that valley, the news comes. Do you know that he ran 20 miles up and down uh, hills and, and valleys to get from Mount Carmel to um, Samaria? He had supernatural energy. He's, he's energy. He'd been coasting on supernatural energy for many days. But then came that word from Jezebel. And it's over. Friend, here's a principle I want you to remember. The vo most vulnerable point in our life is right after we've experienced a mighty victory. When we come off the mountain, we often go right into the valley. Pray for yourself and for others, particularly during high times. The devil wants to strike because he knows at that time when you're feeling invincible and you come down off that high, if he hits you then, it's devastation. It's devastation. And we see that in the mighty Elijah. Two, he was disconcerted by fear. He lost it all. His fear paralyzed him. He lost all perspective. Instead of being impressed with Elijah, Jezebel was infuriated, flew into a rage, and said, I'm going to kill you. Jezebel's threat consumed his every waking thought and overwhelmed his faith. It literally paralyzed him. In his panic, he lost the handle on the power and provision of God. This man just did the unthinkable, the impossible. This man squared off against the king and the, and the army, all of them being there, the prophets of Baal and all the people against him. He changed it all. But in a moment of weakness and vulnerability, a little old woman, in my mind, Jezebel, about so big. You know, if this was a big old rusty speed, ah, oh, you fool with my husband, I'm going to beat you. You know, the, some big six foot eight Swedish uh, woman you might be scared of, but I'm sure it's a little old woman, but her reputation as being this wicked woman put the fear of God in him. He lost all perspective, all perspective, all that he's done, he lost it. Friends, panic, panic is a serious thing. Listen to me. You've heard me say it before. Don't panic. In any situation, don't panic. You panic, you lost your natural mind. The man who panics dies twice. You've heard my story. I've been out of air, underwater, scuba diving, 100 feet down. No air. How do you get back up on top? Friends, thank God I had training. I knew that at 100 feet down, I have three atmospheres of air and my lungs compressed to one. I knew that um, physics-wise, I knew I can get to the top of this uh, because I'd only been down a short period of time, so um, nitrogen hadn't built up in my system, so I wasn't in danger of getting the bends unless I came up wrong. But friends, 100 feet down, it's dark in there even though you're in the waters of the Bahamas. 100 feet down, you could look up and you don't see the sun. And I'm a hundred feet down, running out of air. I sucked, heard my tank ring, my tank ring announcing it is empty, empty, empty. And I was in fear for my life. I went to go to grab my partner and say, I need your, to use some of your air and we need to go back up. Now he, he went the other direction. I said, if I do that again, I get panic. So I said, Lyle, don't panic. You need to go. In fear, I shot up too fast, instantly realized you cannot go that fast. What did they say? What did they say? Well, they said, you can't go fast in your top bubble. Okay. How fast should you let the air out just blow gently okay got that i'm remembering all my rules remembering i'm not panicking I'm telling myself don't panic i'm saying you can't go fast in top bubbles because what it will mean is the air will expand in your blood system quicker than it can be processed and that creates bends so i'm going up going up going up saying don't panic Lyle, don't panic in the meantime the devil is there dun dun I 
said. You understand me, Bastana? I'm saying, I'm saying, Lyle, don't panic. Don't you panic. Don't you panic. Don't you panic. Just get to the top. Get to the top. Don't panic. Don't panic. And I'm breathing out the whole time. And folks, you know you can't breathe out for three minutes. You can't breathe out for three minutes. Your mind starts playing tricks on you. You can't breathe out. Yes, you can. And you have to fall back on your training. Fall back on your training. Don't let what you think know to be the case be the case. You have three atmospheres of air in your lungs. You can continue to breathe out. Well, obviously, I made it. No time for the rest of that story, but obviously, I made it. The point I want to say simply is this. Had I panicked, I would not be here. Uh, those of you that like me would be visiting the... He'd say, he was a good man. <laughs> but I'm here today because I did not panic, and I call on the Lord the whole way through. Call on the Lord the whole way through. But, but friends, Elijah panicked. Elijah panicked, and he was paralyzed by fear. He shifted his focus from God to the problem. And many times we find ourselves in the same place where we shift from the God who can do all things to our problem. We become overwhelmed and destroyed by fear. Destroyed by it. The man who panics dies twice. The man who panics dies twice. He will cause himself to die by his panic. Elijah tucked his tail between his legs and ran for his life. Here's Israel. This man is running down as far as he can get. He runs to the farthest post of the nation of Israel and Judah and runs further than that into the desert. Finds a broom tree, falls down, says, I won't die. I just won't die. I can't take this no more. Jezebel's threat has shaken him to his core. And instead of praying to God for help, this man has prayed to God for help for the last three and a half years, for who knows how long. And he's seen God answer. But this man never seeks to pray and call on God to aid him, only to take his life because he's so, so afraid. And friends, friends, some of us have experienced overwhelming fear and dread like that. And it's easy to take our eyes off the Lord. The problem's overwhelming. And we now feel we got to go to somebody else to help us out. You want to know what someone believes, really believes? Put them under pressure. They'll show you. And so you may say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Every time Pastor Lyle talks about gambling, but when the going gets tough, you realize, listen, listen, flowers can help me out now. <laughs> Mom, what you say you dream? Friends. Where was flowers when God was providing and protecting you all those years? Flowers can't protect your house from robbery. Anyone out there hearing me? So friends, be careful what you do in a panic. Be careful. God is still God. God still loves you. Yet while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Before you knew what was going on, God bit on your side. Careful with what panic says. Panic says God can't be trusted. Panic say, listen, listen, listen. God must see on a vacation. Listen. Do what you can to help yourself. And some of y'all ladies panic too now. The clock getting, the clock ticking. Ain't no one in sight. You grab a whole scoundrel. Come here, boy. Look like you got something. Come here, come here. Come here. You ain't know nothing about that valley. My, these days, the, 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 the fellas they grab and don't even look good. I remember a time woman used to say, boy, I like you. You mean you can make pretty children. Now you say, God have mercy. She wasn't thinking that when she grabbed the valley. And vice versa? <laughs> I see too much of that vice versa. But anyway, fear is a serious thing. Fear is a serious thing. You believe it's getting so bad now, I just got to grab me anything. Just say I got me with a man, with a piece of man. But boy, that man can give you a piece. He can give you a, a he can give you a world of trouble. <laughs> world of trouble. Ladies, I can tell you again. Man, listen to. Don't grab no one off the side of the road say you can marry this person. If your pastors can't agree, if your pastors cannot validate for you this is the kind of man you need to marry, run him! Run him! Because the only thing you can bring on me is more work. I buy your house again. Oh. You understand me? Watch 
fear now. Fear ain't your friend. Listen to me. The only hold the devil has on you is fear. You are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. But boy, if the devil could get you fear, pull it over. You know what my Bible says? Guess what? A bet is in your Bible too. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lo roaring lion looking for someone, i.e. you, to devour. And the devil roars and he attempts to frighten and what he does is he creates panic. I need to research this a little bit more, but I'm told that it's really the older lions, not as fast anymore. Sheep teeth are not as sharp as them who like to do the roaring. Because they figure if I could get you panic, some animals just as get paralyzed in fright, they could almost walk up and eat them. But friends, because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished on Calvary's cross, the devil is a toothless old lion when it comes to the sovereign God. If you're fearful, get it right. We're going to go through that, how you, can, how you can be helped in that regard. But don't let the devil paralyze you into fear that you destroy your life for, for a foolish decision. Let me say this. Never, and I mean never, make a decision in fear. Never make a decision where your emotions are out of whack. Never. 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 Because you're not thinking clearly. You don't have God's counsel. You don't have the counsel of, of godly wisdom. You don't have it. Do not make decisions when you're overwhelmed with emotions, when you're tired, don't make decisions. Some people sell a farm in fear. And, and, and there was no reason, reason for it. But the devil calculated and made things look fearful. And you acted foolishly. Some people throw away a good marriage just out of pure terror and fear of something. And, or frustration. And it can be saved. So we need to be careful what we do in extreme emotion. We need to be careful. We have a God we can call on. Let's call on him. Three, Elijah was disabled by isolation. He was disabled by isolation. What do you mean, Pastor Lyle? I want you to understand, Elijah was stuck in an emotional overdrive. He was driven, fatigued, tired, exhausted, weary, burned out, anxious, and running on empty. And then he compounds a problem. He left his companion who had been with him the whole time, who know his ins and outs. He left him and went into the wilderness. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but I have found for myself friends all of my Christian life who I allow to speak to me at any time about anything, who know me well enough to say, now Lyle, you need, you need to catch yourself. You see, friends... God has given us friendships, companionship. He's given us marriage because we're not all that and we need persons to speak into our lives who know us well enough and who care well enough to say, this needs to change. Children, he's given you parents. And many of you enjoy godly parents. Heed your godly parents. They've been there before you. They know what it is they're trying to avoid you having to deal with. Heed them. No, you ain't smarter than them. Heed them. Because God has given them to you as your protection. Friends, Elijah had a man who could have spoken to him and said, Elijah, listen, what happened? Your God died? D did God die yesterday? After he did that, did he die? Why are you not calling on him? Why are you letting that woman scare you like this? Elijah, God hid you for three and a half years because it wasn't the time. Elijah, you pray and things happen. Why are you acting like a little... <laughs> now, not the other use of that word, but... You know, that's okay, you're acting like a little girl. Why are you acting like a little girl? This is unlike you, Elijah. Had Elijah kept his, his servant, his servant could have tell him, man up. You're acting inappropriate. Friends, there's power in companionship. Godly friends to walk with you. There's power in that. What do the scriptures say? Um, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Woe to the one who faces danger by, by himself. Two can resist where one cannot. Worst thing he could have done was to let go of someone who could have spoken to him in the midst of his depression. 
One of the great dangers of depression is its tendency to turn one inward. Let's admit something this morning. Many of us do the same thing. When we're hurting, we withdraw from others. Instead of reaching out, we pull into our shelves, and then we wonder, why do we feel so alone? I cannot tell you sometimes how... Now, understand, I don't preach at people in messages. I believe that's a sin. I don't preach at people. But some, many times when I'm preaching, I believe the Lord is saying, you know, I gave, this, I gave you this word because it's for so-and-so. I realized, I realized I wasn't preaching. Oh, and you know what? Sometimes they ain't there. Sometimes they're not there. Sometimes they're not there. Friends, if you're going through rough times, why in God's name would you let the devil tell you don't go to church? My God! Where are you going to hear a healing word? Master, speak thy servant, hear it. Why would you first conclude, don't go to church? Can somebody help me? That is the most ignorant thing a Christian can do. It is beyond ignorance. God can speak to you in a song. God can speak to you by a, a church member who knows what's going on, perhaps, with you, who's been praying for you, and God gives them a word. God can speak to the preacher. Why in God's name would someone in the midst of a problem say they ain't going to church? I can tell you right now, the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. Don't fall prey to that old transparent lie. Don't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Master is going to speak, I tell you, you might as well use the things you know that he uses as well. Now, that's not to say he can't speak to you somewhere else. But boy, I can go where the odds are good. I can go where the odds are good and better that I can hear him in church. Don't let the devil play that card on you, man. You got more sense than that. You got the little sense you have, you should have spiritual sense. It'll help you. That'll make sense. Okay, he was devastated by self pity. Devastated by self-pity. He developed a real victim mentality. Oh, Lord, look at me. How you let this happen to me. My Bible says in Hebrews 11, believers are suffering all around the world just like you. What do you mean only you? Or, or why me? You suffered like Job yet? Uh, uh, Hebrews says you've not res resisted to the shedding of your blood. What are you talking about? Why me? Well, friends, if you are a believer, I want you to know the devil says, why not him? Why mm -hmm. not her? I want them. They're around here, but Christian, let me test them. Which image Christian they are? So there's going to be those moments in your life when you are in the crosshairs of the devil's uh, um, attacks. And there's also going to be times when, um, you know, you, you, you've gone further than God would have had you to go, and uh, your own pride and, and hubris has gotten in the way, and you have to bear the consequences of that. Friends, don't stick with the why me. Say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Elijah is so utterly exhausted. He falls asleep. He uh, is ready to throw in the towel. But I'm here today to tell you folks, with all that we've heard, burnout, for that's what he is, burnout is a reversible condition. It's a reversible ailment. Some of you here today are burned out. You're tired. You're frustrated. You're angry, perhaps, with God. You're angry with life. Things have not gone well. Last year devastated you. Uh, you still ain't recovered from the year before. And, and, and you know what? You're burned out. Lord, why don't you just let me die? Because you, you're really mishandling me. Hmm? I'd ask for a witness, but you're only going to give me that today. <laughs> Friends, I'm here to tell you that the great physician has a prescription for us when we find ourselves in these times. And the first prescription I want to give to you is this. Rest. 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 This may surprise you. Instead of God telling him to suck it up like a man and snap out of it, God knew the most important medicine Elijah needed was rest. Rest. Friends, when you're emotionally involved, maybe you just need to rest. Put on some praise music and just rest. Rest. The most important thing he needed was not a lecture from God. Just needed rest. Food and rest. He'd collapsed under that tree exhausted. But because God loves us, he is with us at all times and knows every hiding place we're at. 
The Bible says in Psalm 139, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Oh, friends, when it gets rough, just lay down in the presence of the Lord and say, Lord, hold me until I can get through this. Sustain me. Help me. I just want to rest. I just want to rest in the bosom of my Lord and rest. Catch myself. God sent that angel. The angel continued to provide him with something to eat. Friend, you see, our bodies are designed to need rest. You can either wait until you're totally maxed out like Elijah was and collapsed and totally exhausted, or you can take the healthy approach and begin to incorporate rest into your life. Don't be afraid to slow down and set a pace for your life. Some people are so good at serving the Lord, they almost believe resting is a sin. Now, I don't mean all of y'all, because some of y'all need to serve the Lord. All right, so <laughs> please, I talk in different audiences now, okay? Some people serve the Lord too much, they need to learn how to rest. And if I had money, sometimes I would say, listen, here's some money, go to Miami, do some shopping, rest. Uh, just, just, just catch yourself, rest. Some other people, I will get my cat and just get the wig. Huh? Go to the island, yes, yes, even better. Not the sad who need to get the wig, the sad who need to rest. Two. Two, not only did Elijah need rest, he needed to rediscover God. You see, he lost sight of God, and he needed to rediscover God. When you're emotionally strung out, it's easy to think that everyone is against you. Everyone is against you. Nobody understands. We no longer have any emotional margins. Even God seems distant. After... after after regaining his strength, um, we learn that Elijah traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Mount Horeb. And as I said, this is the same mountain that, Eli that, that God met Moses on. And friends, you know what's interesting? It should not have taken him 40 days and 40 nights. Now, mind you, the mountain's a couple hundred miles away but not 40 days or 40 nights. He was wandering aimlessly. So broken was he, so lost was he, so afraid, so frightened, so out of it. Okay, that's why God gave him rest. But God now understands he needs to rediscover who I am. Once he arrived and went into that cave and spent the night, God addressed him. What are you doing here, Elijah? God knew why Elijah was there, friends. Don't be deceived. But he wanted Elijah to answer. God's not asking because he needs the information, but because he wants to provoke a response out of us. After giving an answer that still revealed his shaky emotional state, God decided that Elijah needed to rediscover the divine and told him to come out of the cave and stand on the mountain because God himself was about to pass by. And as I told you, Elijah knew God in his power. And so when Elijah saw all of these things, the mountains being blown apart by the wind, the earthquake and the fire, he thought surely God was in these things, but he wasn't. Now, how that all worked out, I don't know, but we need to hear what the narrator is saying. He wasn't in those things, but he was in the quiet voice. And friends, that's why I really wanted you to hear Master speak today, because you need to understand don't worry about God and his power. Make sure you hear that voice that cheereth. Make sure you hear that voice that gives direction. Make sure you hear that voice that lets you know what you need to do. Oh, friends, there have been times in my life where God graciously spoke to me. Graciously. Sometimes audibly, sometimes a, 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 a sense within me. And I had to make shifts in my life to respond to God. Master, speak, thy servant heareth. That is the best posture a believer can, ha can have. Because God is going to deliver you as you obey his word. Not as you hear his word, you know. Not master, speak, thy servant heareth. 
I just want to know what you say it. Longing for thy gracious word. Why? Because the hearer is going to do what God says. Because when God bends low to speak to you, that's a powerful word that's going to help you and get you where you need to go. <clears throat> but we find Elijah sitting in a cave. We find him sitting in a cave. And friends, many of us find ourselves in caves. We're hiding away from God. When shame comes, when pain comes, we hide. Do you know how many times, or, or rather, I want you to think about your experiences. When you are horribly embarrassed about something, what's one of the first things you do? Hide. Don't you kind of try and hide your face? Something about, we just want to hide. You just go hide under a bed or something. The shame is just so great. Elijah is hiding in a cave. And I want to ask you today, what are some caves that you're in this morning? Some of you, I believe, might be in a cave of offense. You're mad at God about something. You're mad that God maybe hasn't been what he ought to be or didn't come through the way you thought and you've withdrawn from God because you're angry with him. Some of us are in a cave of despondency. You're feeling numb and isolated from people and places. And some are in a cave of comfort. They're too comfortable to do anything for the Lord. They like the way things are. They're wrapped up in their own comfort and selfishness and they ain't got nothing to do. But friends, Elijah was in a cave. And God calls him out of the cave that he would give him a word that would deliver him. Friends, I want you to come out of the caves that you're in. Caves of isolation, caves of offense, caves of pain, whatever the cave is, come out and hear from the Lord and say, Master, speak, thy servant heareth. I want to hear. I want to know. I want to know what you're saying to me. When Elijah heard the soft voice of God, he got out of his cave of self-pity. He pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Elijah was awe-stricken. He had never seen or known God quite in this way. God of power, yes, but a God who can personally come and minister to me in this way. It's a new experience for him. He needed to learn that God was with him when things were going good, and also God was with him when things were going tough. God doesn't always keep us from going through difficult times, beloved, but he does promise to walk through those times with us. Hearing God's whisper reminded Elijah that God was still in control of all the circumstances of his life. And if we want to rediscover God, it's important to emotionally downshift. We need to remove some of the noise and clutter from our lives. God is hard to hear when we're so inundated with the other things of life. Friends, I know the value. I, I know how my soul operates. I know the value of going on personal prayer retreats. Sometimes I've just gone for days. Sometimes I've gone for three or four days. My journal's out. My prayer music is there. My, my Bible is open. Some other books that God has brought to my attention that I'm to be going through. And I spend time alone with God. And you know what? The noise... gets muted and you're able to hear from the Lord but friend that's where it gets dangerous you see you can't just hear from the Lord you have to hear from the Lord and do what he says so many Christians get to the place where they want to hear from the Lord but they're not prepared to do what he says now that's a little bit difficult when I had time I would share a perfect illustration of that but maybe that'll come at another time but let's finish our message today God gives Elijah a reassignment. That's our third prescription. Elijah gets a reassignment. Now that Elijah's rested and has rediscovered God, he's given a third prescription. Go and anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha to succeed you as prophet. In other words, don't just sit here in your fear. Go and do something now. And friends, to get to Hazel, he's got to go mighty close to Jezebel. But he's on a mission now. He's been recommissioned. He's been reassigned. Go and do this. And when you're doing that, go and anoint Jehu, king of Israel. In other words, he can replace Ahab. Well, but if God tell you, go and anoint the person who's going to replace, replace Ahab, what does that tell you? 
What did I tell you? I can't hear you. What? Ahab hey, finished. He said, listen, I can, I can kill Ahab. He told you go and anoint his successor. Get it? You scared of Ahab? Don't be scared of him. I'm telling you to anoint his successor. And, and, and I know you might be thinking Hazel is there to take advantage. Uh, sorry, that, that Aram will always take advantage of this. No, no, you're going to anoint Hazel as a successor there. And listen, because you're so burned out, I have a reassignment for you. Go and get Elisha and anoint him and pour your life into him. Friends, listen to me. I had the glorious privilege of being chosen one of 60, called out by Josh McDowell himself, serving the Lord for 52 years. We all, those of you that are aware, he has been the foremost voice, Christian, apologi Christian apolog apologist, defending the faith, um, uh, giving us wonderful arguments that's found in his book, Evidence of Demands, a Verdict, More Than a Carpenter, and so forth. He has done the church a great service. Well, Josh McDowell is 72 years old. And I believe Josh McDowell has heard it's time for a reassignment, and he is pouring himself into others. And during that week that I was away, he poured into our lives principles and things that other people don't get in school. The life experience of a man who's learned to trust God in some truly amazing and difficult places and tricks of the trade that he's learned. Wonderful experience. Wonderful experience. Brothers and sisters, I believe that in our fatigue, God is reassigning us. I've watched with my own eyes and over the last couple of years, Pastor Rex's reassignment as he's, as he's building other churches and raising up new younger leadership and giving them his all and training and putting his life into them. Still preaching, praise the Lord. Still one of this nation's best preachers. But he's shifting. And he's pouring his life. He's already poured his life into the leadership of grace. And thanks be to God for him having done that. But Elijah gets rest, he rediscovers God, and he gets a reassignment. And I want to encourage you, friends. I'm encouraged by leadership, too. We need to be pouring our lives into other people. I believe all of us need to have our Elishas. And you know, it's, it's like a relay race. God is moving and advancing his church along, and during that, there are people involved in the process. Some start, some take the baton, they build up speed, pass that to the next one and to the next one. And friends, we're in this together. And as Pastor Rex held his church as a steward over the ministry of God and handed the baton off to myself as a steward of the ministry of God, I don't hold grace in my hand with a vice grip. I hold it knowing that one day I must give it with all the help and support I can to the next person, that they may run with the combined strength of a Rex Major and a Lyle Bethel and run with faster speed because of the good advantage we gave them. And friends, I'm here to tell you that every ministry of grace need to be doing that. Every ministry, we need to be pouring our lives into the next generation. If you die, who's going to replace you? And friends, let me, let me show you something. Elisha was his boon companion from that point on. Elisha was a great help to him. And guess what? Friends, they talk about Elijah more than anybody else, but I'm telling you, Elisha better than Elijah. Come on, if you thought Elijah was bad, Elisha is carry on. Like, like I, I mean, this fellow. This fellow is, is say, Lord, blind this army man so they can't see nothing. And then when he leads them away, Lord, give them eyes to see so they, they can see again. This fellow had some amazing prayers. Raised people from the dead, left and right. An amazing fellow. Why? The life of Elijah had been passed on through him. And he took that and asked the Lord for a double portion. He really wanted to be the true successor to Elijah. And God took his gifts, combined with Elijah's gifts, and made a mighty man of him. We must be building those who are coming behind us. We've got to be doing it because we're not going to be here that long. We're in a relay race, and folks need to be getting uh, the head start that they need. But uh, uh, let me just wrap up now. Elijah thought it was only him. God corrects him. No, I have 7,000 7, 
who are just like you. 7,000, it's not just you. So don't, don't fall victim mentality. Second, you obviously need a reassignment, and God gives him a reassignment, but not just that, a boon companion to help him out, to whom he can pass his life on through. And that's the fourth prescription, relationships. God gives him a new relationship by which uh, he can um, no longer be subject to, to worry and, and fear and anxiety. And friends, Hebrews 10, 24, 25 tells us not to give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but to encourage one another and all the more as we see that day approaching. And so I want to encourage every one of you, build relationships with godly men and women around you. Men build godly relationships with men around you. Women, the same. Uh, watch these relationships between men and women. It's, it can be a problem. You can slip into the wrong kinds of things. Uh, but, but, but friends, God has a prescription for you where you are, but you need to hear the voice of the Lord. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose. As we were reminded on Wednesday, God, God loves you and knew you before you were born, before you were knit together in your mother's womb. God had a plan for you. He says of Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you, and I had a plan for you. Friends, let's find God's plan. Let's take time to mute the noise of this world and get alone with God and get that voice that cheer it, that voice that sustains it, the voice that takes us through. I'm going to call us to make some commitments in just a moment, but right now I'm going to ask the band uh, to help us to consummate these moments of consecration to the Lord. And then I'm going to ask you to stand for prayer as we trust the Lord. Wait for that word that will sustain and cheer us, give us rest, help us to rediscover him, give us a reassignment, and solidify those relationships. Amen. What would it take for the natural man to see? We're moving right on into eternity. He's got it all in control. And because you know that, you can get out of your cave, your cave of despondency, your cave of uh, offense, your cave of fear. Come out. Come in, out into the light of his grace. Come out and hear a word from the master who is able to sustain you. Come out. Come out. He's not always there in power. So don't be frightened by the power of others. But he has a word for you, a word that will sustain, a word that will refresh, a word that will revive. And so today, if you would like prayer for what this year has in store, and you'd like to know that God is there to give you that word that will sustain, and you want to register in the courts of heaven, God me, it's me, standing in the need of prayer. I'd like to invite you to stand to your feet, and I will pray for you at this time. Once the spread is love, keep down in the soul. He's got it all in control. Raise
raise your hands to the one who is able to fill your hands with his grace. Open your hearts to the one who is able to give you a new heart and a new mind. Let go of fear. The Bible says, um, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, you want to in these moments. Let God know that your ear is open to his word, that your heart is wide open to receive his instructions, and your feet are prepared to move in response to what he said. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, behold your people, your children, the flock of your own pasture, the sheep of your own hand, who are before you this day, before the throne of grace, seeking that word that cheereth, that word that sustains. Lord, we need you. We need you. We don't know what the future holds for us, but we look to the one who holds the future. We don't know, Lord, last year there were deaths in our families, there were uh, murders, there was losses, there were losses of jobs, there were many things that we weren't quite prepared for. But Lord, we begin this year by placing our lives in your hands. We choose by faith to walk out of the caves of despondence, despondency, isolation, pain, fear. And we ask, oh God, please speak to us. Our hearts are open to receive. Our ears are open. We say, Master, speak. Your servant is listening. Speak. Give us a word. But Lord, in the meantime, I submit my life to you. I choose to rest in you. I ask that you would restore and revive me. I pray, Lord, that if needed, you would reassign me. But always, Lord, I ask that you would give me godly companionship. It will be a source of encouragement and joy to me. I submit to the leadership of my church and pray, Lord, that you would give uh, my leaders wisdom to know how they can instruct and counsel and aid me in my life. I pray that you would help me to be a better Christian in all that I do and say on my job, in church, wherever I would find myself. But Lord, here I am, your servant. Like Elijah, we say, here I am, use me. Here I am, work through me. May I be a vessel for your glory. You have made us to be your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good work. We ask that you would show us the good work that you have us for us to do, and that we would do it to the praise and glory of your glorious name. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray and make our boast. Amen and amen. As we continue singing, we just want to remind all of you that we have refreshments prepared for you upstairs. We'd like all of you to join the police force and your leaders for moments of light refreshments upstairs. The Lord bless you. May the Lord sustain and keep you in all things. And may the light of his countenance bless you in all things, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Lamp lighters, please remain for photo taking. I'm, 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 I'm,